So you maybe are familiar with the movie called uh, Message in a Bottle. Huh? Yeah, Message in a Bottle. Those of you ladies shaking your head. Romantic drama. In 1999, Kevin Costner was the lead actor. Robin Wright was the uh, leading actress. And Paul Newman was in this movie. So the premise of the movie is called Message in a Bottle. And Robin Wright, her character, is walking on the beach in Cape Cod. And she finds a bottle that has a message in it. And so the message has the name, uh, who it is written to, which is Catherine, the wife of this guy named Garrett, who's played by Kevin Costner. And so Robin Wright goes on this painstaking trek to try to track down this guy Garrett, who wrote this message in a bottle. Very romantic. It ends in the, uh, the romantic story of happily ever after. Uh, So maybe rent the movie, but as we get into this book that we're going to start reading today, we're going to start studying and going through the book of Hebrews. So the the Bible has 66 books in it, and archaeologists have been, been discovering and digging for hundreds upon hundreds of years and finding these artifacts. They find these works of antiquity. Uh, The Bible was discovered as a book of antiquity. And the archaeologists, what they do is they want to date it, is one of the things they're trying to do is uh, through their science, is try to date when this this article was discovered. And then they want to know, well, who wrote this article? Who wrote this letter? Who wrote this book? And then they want to know, well, who did they write to? So they're trying to piece together all of these things so that they could scientifically say, well, this this is when it was dated. This is who wrote it, and this is who it was written to. That's kind of the job of an archaeologist when they find these these works of antiquity. So 66 books in the Bible, and most of them fit this profile where these archaeologists, through uh, the scientific method of investigation and uh, this process of being able to date and put names to and putting the context together, have been able to do that with most of the books in the Bible, the 66 books that we have. But there's one book that does not fit this profile, and that's the book that we're going to start today, and it's the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a mysterious letter. It's an anonymous letter, similar to this anonymous letter that uh, Robin Wright is trying to find who the, who the guy is, all right? And maybe you remember as a kid receiving an anonymous letter or uh, from your secret admirer. Didn't you always want to find out, well, who is my secret admirer? Who wrote this anonymous letter to me? And if it was a real juicy one, you really wanted to know who it was. And if you didn't find out, it would drive you crazy, right? It would drive you crazy. So this brings us to the anonymous letter of Hebrews. Who is the author of Hebrews? Where were they when they wrote this letter? Who were the recipients of this letter? Where were they when they received the letter? When was it written? So one question would be, well, why does this all matter? Why does it matter who wrote Hebrews, who received Hebrews? When was it written? Why does that even matter? So before we get into this letter, this incredible letter that is part of the canon of Scripture, part of the 66 books in the Bible, part of the 27 books of the New Testament, before we get into it, we want to ask the questions that we would ask when we're going to read anything of the Bible. We want to ask these investigative questions. We want to know the context of what we're reading. We want to know the historical context of what we're reading. We want to know the cultural context of what we're reading. We want to know what the spiritual climate was during that time of what we're reading. If we're going to study it and get to know it and then begin to try to interpret it and then begin to to teach it and meditate on it, we want to know the context of it. This is one of the rules, really, of interpreting Scripture is you always interpret Scripture within Scripture. You always interpret the Bible within the Bible. So you want to ask these questions. What is the political climate? What was, the, what was the intention of the writer? What was going on with those people who received it? What was their spiritual condition? So we always interpret the Bible and read the Bible within its context. So that's what we're going to try to do with this mysterious book that is titled Hebrews, Letter to the Hebrews. There's a lot of question marks that go with this book. So a lot of people might even avoid teaching through this book because of the 
the question marks. Consequently, Hebrews was one of the last books to make the canon of Scripture because of this, because they didn't know who wrote it. Who wrote it? That's such a big deal to know. Does this have any apostolic authority whatsoever if we're going to put it in the canon of Scripture? So it's a mysterious book with all these uncertainties. But it's also a book that has the most detailed Greek in all of the New Testament in it. Very detailed, very sophisticated Greek. So whoever wrote it was sophisticated and they knew the Greek language. And then it has more references, saturated with references to the Old Testament more than any other New Testament book. It's saturated with, with uh, Old Testament references. This guy, E.F. Scott, he wrote of the mysteriousness of Hebrews. He said, the epistle to the Hebrews is in many respects the riddle of the New Testament. Sir Edmund Gose, in his book, Father and Son, says of Hebrews, he says the melodious language, the divine forensic audacities, the magnificent ebb and flow of argument which make the epistle to the Hebrews such a miracle were far and away beyond my reach, and they only bewildered me. So as we journey through Hebrews, we're going to try to do so humbly and as accurately as possible as we go on this journey. We're starting today. We're only going to get like a little bit into it today because of this introduction to try to figure out, well, what, what is this book, Hebrews? Who is it written to? What are, what, what's the outline of it? What can we learn about it before we ever even get into it? So let me read a little, a little allegory written by John Phillips talking about the climate and what a person who maybe received this letter of Hebrews, what they might have been going through and thinking. So bear with me as I read this. It's going to read quite a bit of it, okay? So follow along with me. It says, The trumpets of the temple sound long and loud, the daily summons to the evening sacrifice, and the priests perform their required washings, attire themselves in their gorgeous vestments, and set out for the house of God, which crowns the hill Moriah, like a golden diadem, glittering and flashing in the sun. Again, the summons rings forth, and yet again for the third and last time. The officiating priests of the day hasten up the broad steps leading to the outer court. From all over Jerusalem, the people, the Levites, and the priests flock toward the temple as the surrounding hills echo back the trumpet sound. Standing somewhere in the assembled crowd is a Jew, born of the tribe of Levi and of the house of Aaron, thus by every right a priest. But he has become a Christian. So the splendid temple and its gorgeous ritual decreed by holy writ and by traditions reaching back far from century to century is no longer for him. However, he gazes at it somewhat wistfully, feeling a tug at his heart. Although he knows that the temple and its functions are mere shadows and that the substance is Christ, the temple looks so real and the ritual speak with such authority that the shadow looks like the substance, while the substance seems like the shadow. The epistle to the Hebrews was written for him. And in a house, off an alley a few blocks from the massive wall of Jerusalem, is another Jew. In his home, there's a prized possession, a copy of the books of Moses, of the prophets, and of the Psalms. It's been in his family for years, and he knows most of it by heart. Lately, he's been reading it again. He's thinking things through. Can the blood of bulls and goats really take away sin? He asks of himself. Of what value are all these rituals? Surely they must speak of something else. There must be a reality behind them all. And is it really Calvary? Can it be that Christians are right after all? He opens one of the scrolls. And what of these prophecies concerning the Messiah? Ought not Christ to have suffered? How else can Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and Psalm 16 be explained? They pierced my hands and my feet, it says. Thou wilt not suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. What can that mean but resurrection from the dead? And what then? Are the Christians correct when they say that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled such scriptures as these? He goes from scroll to scroll, finding in each one unexplained ceremonies, unsatisfied longings, unfulfilled prophecies. Deciding to stake everything on the despised and rejected Jesus of Nazareth, he becomes a Christian makes his faith known and is cut off from his people. His outraged parents disinherit him. 
cast him out of the family and outside the camp. They hold a funeral for him and consider him dead. His heart aches for his loved ones, for the close-knit family ties of the Jews, missing the cheer and comfort of home, missing the rich ritual in which he has been reared, missing the synagogue and its forms. He begins to wonder if he should go back. The epistle to the Hebrews was written for him. One of the greatest mysteries surrounding this book, Hebrews, this letter, even the title itself, just comes from man, the letter to the Hebrews. The greatest mystery is who wrote this book? Who wrote this letter? Here are some of the possibilities as I did my study. One would be Barnabas. Barnabas maybe wrote the letter to the Hebrews. He was the encourager who discipled Paul. There's even a a verse in there that talks about this book being a book of encouragement. So some say maybe Barnabas. Some say Dr. Luke, right? The Gentile writer of the gospel according to Luke and the writer of the book of Acts. Maybe it was Luke. He was very technical in his Greek. Some say Apollos. He's mentioned in Acts, 1 Corinthians, and Titus. He was a preacher. He was well-schooled in the scriptures. He was someone who, who was taught by Aquila and Priscilla. And then others say even Priscilla maybe wrote it, companion of Paul, traditionally thought to be one of the 70 who was sent out by Jesus. And then finally, the Apostle Paul is a possibility. So second century uh, Christian theologian and author Tertullian, he argues for Barnabas. He says Barnabas wrote it. Reformer John Calvin, he argues for Dr. Luke as being the author. Reformer Martin Luther, he argues for Apollos. The great German scholar Adolf Harnack, he argues for Priscilla as the writer of this letter. But the majority of scholarship argues that Paul was the author of Hebrews. So we're going to assume, not knowing for sure, but as we study it, we're going to probably take the perspective of Paul as we get into the letter of Hebrews, knowing that we don't know for sure if it was Paul. There's a lot of reasons why it was maybe not Paul. Here are some of the reluctancies as to why it was not Paul. The introduction to Hebrews is not a typical Pauline introduction. All of his other 13 letters, he starts the letter out with his name, Paul. And here in Hebrews, there's no introduction like that. Another is this dominating Jewish theme. Paul was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And then we have this letter to the Hebrews that is very Jewish. It's very Jewish in its nature. So it's a letter to the Jews. Some of the evidence for Paul's authorship would be in the final greeting. If you read the last verse or the last couple verses of the letter, he talks about Timothy as if Timothy were someone close to him. So he addresses it in a way, and we know that Paul discipled Timothy. So an argument for Paul's authorship would be the the ending of that, his conclusion. Another is the fact that Paul was a top-of-his-class Jew prior to his conversion. Top of his class. So he knew the Old Testament inside and out, had memorized the first five books of the Bible, had memorized much of the Old Testament, had memorized a lot of the Psalms, and could piece those together. He was trained by a great rabbi named Gamaliel. So he knows the Jewish custom, and he knows the Old Testament well. So he was more than capable of addressing a Jewish audience. And then if Paul is the author, the fact that Hebrews did not have this typical address from him could possibly be two different reasons. One could be that Paul didn't want to take attention away from Jesus because it's a, it's a letter to Jews. And he didn't want to take attention away from Jesus, so he doesn't put his name on it. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that he knew, because he was called to the Gentiles, that the Jewish community hated him. So he didn't want to detract from the message by putting his name on it at the beginning and detract what he was going to be preaching to the Jews. To the Jews. So those are possibilities. But one thing we know for sure, no matter who wrote it, one thing we know from sh- for sure is that we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. We believe that. So we believe that this letter was breathed out by God, even though we don't know for sure who the author, the, the human author was. So another mystery that's surrounding Hebrews is who were its original readers? Well, without going into too much detail about who the original readers were, most agree 
because of the content throughout the entire letter, that it was written to Jewish Christians. It was written to Jewish Christians. So some of you might be wondering, why do we have to know all this before we go? Because we need to know the context of a letter that we're going to go through and we're going to study and we're going to get to know, we're going to see how it applies to our lives. We need to know, well, what was the context that it was written? We don't take the Bible and when we read the Bible, we immediately just bring it into our context. That's where we misinterpret Scripture. Always interpreting Scripture within its context. What did it say? Who said it? Who are they saying it to back then 2,000 years ago? Then we say, okay, well, how does that apply to us in the 21st century? That's why it's so important to go into this detail. Well, what do we know about this book? What do we know about the author and what they might have been thinking? What do we know about some of the themes in it? That's why we're taking the time to do this before we actually get into the verses. Okay, so just bear with. Bear with. So most agree that it was written to Jewish Christians. Former professor of biblical criticism and uh, exegesis at the University of Manchester, F.F. Bruce, this is what he says. He says, the addressees appear then to have been a group of Jewish Christians who had never seen or heard Jesus in person, but they learned of him. They had been exposed to persecution, public abuse, imprisonment, and looting of their property, yet their Christian development had been arrested. Instead of pressing ahead, they were inclined to come to a full stop in their spiritual progress, if not indeed to slip back to a stage from which they left. Very probably, they were reluctant to sever their last ties with a religion, Judaism, with a religion which enjoyed the protection of Roman law and faced the risk of irrevocable commitment to the Christian way. The writer warns them against falling back and encourages them to press on. That's what we're going to find in the letter. William Barclay said in his commentary, we will not be wrong if we think of Hebrews as a letter written to a little group of people who are training to be teachers teachers in the Christian church. It was written to them by their own teacher at a time when he could not come to them in person. So this little group of Christians who are training to teach others. So both of these comments give us a little bit of insight. So where did the original recipients live? The debate has continued on and on throughout the years. Jerusalem, some say, Caesarea, Samaria, Alexandria of Egypt, but most have settled on the destination of the recipients living in Rome. And there's equal debate on where the author was when he wrote it. Where was he or she when they wrote the letter Hebrews? So when was it written? Well, it was written sometime before 70 AD. The conclusion comes from there being no mention of the destruction of the temple. So the destruction of the temple was in 70 AD. And the Hebrew letter talks a lot about the temple with no mention of that. So uh, it's safe to say it probably was written sometime before 70 AD. So this puts in perspective, okay, if Jesus uh, died and was resurrected sometime around 35-ish AD, this puts in perspective how close in line as we read this letter. So here are a couple possible, possible outlines of Hebrews given by two different scholars. One is Philip Hughes, and he breaks it down this way. He breaks it down into five sections. He says, first section is Christ superior to the prophets, is section one. Section two is Christ superior to the angels. So he's superior to the prophets, superior to the angels, and then Christ superior to Moses. So the line just goes on. That starts in chapter three through chapter four. And then Christ superior to Aaron, the priest. That's chapter four all the way through chapter 10. And then finally, he ends with Christ superior as the new living way. John Phillips from the book that I just read, John Phillips says, uh, breaks it into three sections. He says, the superior person of Christ, chapter one and two, the superior provisions of Calvary, chapter three through 10, and then the superior principles of Christianity, which would be chapters 11 through 13. So he breaks it into three sections. So one thing that we can gather just from these outlines from these two different scholars is the superiority of Christ that this letter is a letter talking about the supremacy of Jesus, the supremacy of Christ. So as we enter into it, know that the overarching umbrella on theme of this entire letter is the supremacy of Christ. He is superior to all. His supremacy over all creation, from the foundation of the world to the angels, to the Old Testament law, to the Old Testament sacrificial system, to the Old Testament priesthood, 
Jesus is supreme over all. And that is what the writer is trying to let us know and get to, is that Jesus is supreme, that Jesus is better than all these other things that Jewish Christians might have practiced. Jesus reigns supreme. So this is going to be our approach as we go through and we enter this letter. So now let's get into it. Let's get to verse 1. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. It's as far as we're going to get today. Verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. Don't miss it here. Chapter 1, verse 1. If you have the New American Standard Bible or the KJV or NKJV, it's going to read similar to what I'm reading here. I'm reading out of the NASB. If you have the ESV or the NIV, the words are a little bit changed here. But I really like the way the NASB and the KJV translate this verse. Okay? So, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, comma. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. So I love this translation because it starts with the name God. All of Paul's other epistles, all 13 epistles started with the name Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, whatever. But here, and if we assume that Paul is the one that wrote it, Paul is saying, hey, I'm removing myself and I am saying God. Let's start there. Let's start with God. Starting with God. Philip says, the book of Hebrews has been called the orphan epistle because it lacks the signature of a human author. But God, who delights to be a father to the fatherless, has adopted this epistle. Instead of beginning with the name of Paul or James or Peter, it begins with God. It's no wonder that its human author fades into obscurity. So this brings comfort and reverence from me towards God as I think about all these discrepancies that are accompanying the book of Hebrews to know that it starts with God. It starts with God. It starts with the supremacy of God in the midst of all the controversy over it, over who wrote it, over whom it was written to, where was it? I can rest assured that no matter who the human author was, I can recognize that God was at the beginning. The letter adequate, adequately starts out with the name of our creator, starting with God. He is the authority. I get the sense of awe when I hear this, the holiness that God is the start of this letter. The name from which all other names have come into existence under God. The true author of life, of all of life, and of all of scripture, of every book in the Bible, and every letter in the Bible, the true author is God. God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God is the beginning, and it's appropriate that the letter starts with his name, God. Our Lord's prayer is our Father. Wouldn't it behoove us if we started all of our prayers with our Father? I love how Austin starts his prayers. If you've ever been in a room with Austin and we say, hey, Austin, would you pray? He says, Jesus. That's how he starts his prayer out. Jesus. Isn't that how we should start our prayer out? Jesus or our Father in heaven. That's how we should start our prayer because he is the beginning. He is the beginning. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the start of all things. He was not created, but he is the creator our God. So there are several things that we can learn about God in these, this opening verse. That God spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets, and that God spoke in many portions and in many ways. So the first thing is that God spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets. This is the Old Testament. That's what he, the writer is referring to. This is the Old Testament, that God spoke to mankind through the Old Testament. It's not just history, it's not just wisdom, and it's not just prophecy, it's the very voice of God revealed to us. That is the Old Testament, the voice of God speaking to humanity through the scriptures. This is why we call it the word of God. We say, this is the word of God. That's what we mean. We're not saying that these are words of God, but it's God's word. Breathed out is what the scripture testifies of itself. Breathed out, it's God's word. It's God's word. So first, through the Old Testament, this is what the writer 
of Hebrews is declaring. That God revealed himself and spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets through the Old Testament. So we cannot know God unless he reveals himself to us. And he began that by breathing out the Old Testament. Consequently, the verse that we talked about, 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed, Paul wrote that to Timothy, and he wasn't speaking of the New Testament. Specifically, he was speaking of the Old Testament, that all Scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching and, and rebuking and correcting and training righteousness. All Scripture. The Old Testament, all Scripture. This is God speaking when it says God spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets. So he spoke long ago. Well, who are these fathers spoken of in verse 1? In a general sense, it could mean all of our spiritual ancestors. In a general sense. The fathers, our spiritual ancestors. But more specifically, it's referring to the physical ancestors of the Jewish people. It could also be applied to all humankind from Adam till now. Spoke to the fathers through the prophets. So how did God speak to our our fathers, both the spiritual and the physical fathers? Well, it was through the prophets. So the writer's not only referring to the books of the Old Testament that are called the major and the minor prophets. That's not what he's talking about when he says through the prophets. He's talking about anybody who was a prophet. Anybody who was a prophet in the Old Testament. For example, Abel, Abraham, David, Deborah, Elijah, Elisha, Enoch. All of these, there's, there's countless host of others who were prophets that this scripture is referring to, spoke to, spoke to us through the prophets. Our fathers, through the prophets. And these prophets spoke to men for God. So a prophet speaks to men from God. A priest speaks for men to God. So a prophet is someone who hears from God and speaks to men. That's what the word means here. The Hebrew word, neve, it means spokesman or speaker. The idea of a prophet is somebody who, uh, who is not just uh, predicting the future, but they're speaking, they're a spokesperson for God to man. And a, a prophet brought the message to the people from God. So we see this clearly in the life of Moses, right? In the life of Moses, you see that God spoke to Moses and Moses spoke to the people as a prophet. He spoke to him. Couple, couple verses here. In Exodus 3, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Exodus 33, whenever Moses entered the tent, so he'd enter the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand on the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship, each at his entrance of his own tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. That's God speaking. That's an illustration for us. God speaking to a prophet and a prophet speaking to mankind. Has anyone ever asked you, How has God been speaking to you? What has the Lord said to you lately? Has anybody ever said that to you? That's what they're saying. What what has the Lord said to you? How has he spoken to you? As a follower of Christ, God should be speaking to you all the time. As a follower of Jesus, God should be speaking to you all the time. Well, how? How does God speak to us? There's this premarital counseling book that I use with any couple. So those of you that, that are in here that I'm either doing it with or have done it with, You know the book, it's called Preparing for Marriage by Family Life. By Family Life. And this book has this this wheel called the decision-making wheel. And this decision-making wheel is how do two people whom God has brought together make a decision? Two Christian people, two believers, they come together. How do they make a decision? Well, this decision-making wheel is a way, is a guide to make decisions as believers. It's a way to hear from God. How do we hear from God to make this decision that we're going to do? So it's a picture of a wheel. So if you picture a wheel, it has the hub, has the spokes, and it has the rim. Well, at the hub is a relationship with Jesus, that it starts with the relationship with Jesus. We can't hear from God unless first we have a relationship with Jesus. And then the first spoke, the first spoke of this wheel is the word of God, that God speaks to us in his word. So the first line of decision-making is, well, what is God saying? Has anyone ever said to you, what is God saying? That's what they mean. 
How is God saying anything to me? Because I'm reading the word. I should be able to give an answer as a follower of Christ. Well, this is what God's saying to me. How would I know? Because he spoke to me through his word. It wasn't some loud boom outside. It wasn't some audible voice that I heard, although that can happen, but it's not the normative way to hear from God. The normative way to hear from God is through his word. That's the first line is, what did God say in his word? Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. It, it illumines everything for me. So the first is God's word. The second spoke in this wheel is prayer. James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if we ask through prayer, God will give it to us generously and without reproach. God's going to speak to us through prayer. Starts with the word, and then prayer. And then the third spoke is godly counselors. Surrounding yourself with godly people. What are godly people around me saying as I talk to them? Not replacing it with the word of God or through prayer, but what are godly people saying? The Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs 15, 22 says, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. It's hearing from others, godly counsel. And then the final spoke is desires and circumstances. You have the word of God, you have prayer, you have godly counselors, and you have desires and circumstances. So often in the pursuit of doing God's will, we try to suppress our own desires, thinking, oh no, I can't have any desires. That's not what the scriptures teach. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is the one who wants to match his desires with your desires, your desires with his desires. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, the scripture says. And then the rim is the inner working of the Holy Spirit. So the hub is a relationship with Jesus and the rim is the Holy Spirit speaking to us. In the Gospel of John, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit being our guide and our teacher and our helper. Often in the Bible, the word for spirit is uh, parakletos, which means one called to the side of another. So when Jesus said, I'm gonna leave you a helper, he said, I'm giving you uh, someone who's gonna stand to your side and help you and guide you and teach you, and his name is Holy Spirit. Oswald Chambers says, in my utmost for his highest, he says this, Genesis 18 brings out the delight of true friendship, friendship with God as compared with simply feeling his presence occasionally in prayer. This friendship means being so intimately in touch with God that you never even need to ask him to show you his will. It is evidence of a level of intimacy which confirms that you are nearing the final stage of your disciplined life of faith. When you have a right standing relationship with God, you have a life of freedom, liberty, and delight. You are God's will, he says. And all your common sense decisions are actually his will for you, unless you sense a feeling of restraint brought on by a check in your spirit. You are free to make decisions in the light of a perfect and delightful friendship with God, knowing that if your decisions are wrong, he will lovingly produce that sense of restraint. So do you see the idea here? The, the, the quote-unquote formula to hear from God is we start with the word of God. The word of God. It's not to start with our desires or our circumstances. It's not to say, well, what is the spirit saying to me? It's not to say, well, these are my circumstances. It's not to say, well, this is what I'm praying about. We'll start with the word of God. God wants to speak to us. He's revealed to us and spoken to us by his word. That's what it means, his word. Then we go into prayer. So we hear from God through his word. We go into prayer and we pray about it. God, this is what I'm getting a sense that you're saying to me. And then we might talk to some, a few godly counselors. I wouldn't have a, a lot of people that you're going to go talk to, but a few whom you trust whom you've rubbed shoulders with, whom, you, whom you've done life with, say, hey, this is what I've read in God's word, and this is what I'm praying about. Tell me what you think. As you know me, tell me what you think. And they'll be able to advise you. And then you take your desires and your circumstances. Say, God, I don't just want my desires. I want your desires for me. As we're led by the Holy Spirit. And this is what Chambers says. He says, when you have a right standing relationship with God, you have a life of freedom, liberty, and delight. You are God's will. All of your common sense decisions are actually his will for you, unless you have this sense of restraint. 
through the inner working of the Holy Spirit. So it's not just this, this set-apart thing, but a relationship with God, and in His Word, we hear from Him. This is what Hebrews is talking about when it says, God spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets. So back to Hebrews 1.1. The second part, the writer says that God spoke in many portions and in many ways. So God spoke, spoke long ago. God is the one that spoke long ago to the fathers, through the prophets, and he did it in many portions and in many ways. The ESV says at many times and in many ways. So the word for many times or many portions, it's one word in Greek, polymeros. And this word is, re- is referring to the times that God has spoken over the course of time in the books of the Old Testament. Many times over the course of the Old Testament, God has spoken, and then in many ways. It's also one word in the Greek, holotropos. This word is referring to God speaking in the Old Testament through many different manners. John MacArthur says God spoke to men. Sometimes it was in a vision, sometimes by a parable, sometimes through a type or a symbol. So God spoke in the Old Testament books through many different literary ways. He spoke through narrative. He spoke through poetry. He spoke through wisdom, through law, through prophecy. Some ways were doctrinal, ethical, moral, warning, rebuke, some even through encouragement. He even spoke through a donkey. So God speaks. He speaks. And he did it in many different ways and at many different times. MacArthur continues. He says, yet... Beautiful and important and authoritative as it is, the Old Testament is fragmentary and incomplete. It was delivered over the course of some 1,500 years by some 40-plus writers in many different pieces, each with its own truth. It began to build and grow truth upon truth. It was what we call progressive revelation. Genesis gives some truth. Exodus gives some more, and on and on and on. The truth builds, and it builds, and it builds upon itself. But it's progressive revelation. That's what we have in the Old Testament, this progressive revelation. So this leads us into next week, as the writer of Hebrews goes from building on God's revelation in Old Testament to God's final and ultimate revelation in Jesus Christ. The supreme one Jesus Christ, who is superior to all Old Testament revelation. He fulfills the scripture, and the writer of Hebrews is going to take us from the Old Testament today. We go through verse 1, and then he's going to go into this final revelation of Jesus Christ by God. So we're going to discover this in in verse 2. God speaking in the Old Testament was only his partial revelation to us. So what is our takeaway from this? What's our takeaway from all this kind of mundane, boring stuff? What's our takeaway from this? Well, that God is 100% completely, unequivocally sovereign. God is in control. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last, period. God. God. God is the one who starts in that letter. God speaks. Something else that we can take. That God speaks. That he is intimately involved in each of his children's lives. He's intimately involved. God speaks all the time, and God wants to speak. God longs to speak to you and to me, his children, those of us that have been born again. God wants to speak to us, and he does speak today. God is not a God that spun the the earth into existence and then sits back, as the deists believe, and sits back and just says, hey, you're on your own. No, God is intimately involved today, intimately involved in our lives. And he wants to speak to us. He spoke to our forefathers in the days of old, and he speaks to us today. So let me ask you, does he speak to you through his word? Does he speak to you through his word? Do you know his word? Do you read his word? Do you invite him to speak to you through his word? Is your prayer life full of communing with the Father as he speaks to you, and you speak to him? And you declare, as Austin would say, Jesus, and then talk to him, our Father Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Is your prayer life full of communing with the Father? Do you have a set of godly men and women in your life whom you trust, that you surrounded yourself with, whom can speak truth into your life? Not a lot of yes men, necessarily. who Just say yes, but can really speak 
love and truth into your life? And are you so intimate with God? Are you so intimate with God that his desires and your desires match? They're the same. They match. What you want is what God wants for you. You're so intimately involved with God. You know him so well, and he knows you so well. And then third, Jesus Christ is the one who reigns supreme. He is the one who reigns supreme. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. As we're going to discover over the next many months that Jesus is supreme. He's supreme over all, and he is God's ultimate revelation to mankind. Is Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus your king? Does he reign supreme in your life? To know God is to know Jesus. To ask the question, I want to know God? Well, know Jesus, because he is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one who reigns supreme. He is the one who reigns supreme. So we are going to uh, jump in the weeks ahead as we just navigate. I would encourage you to read the letter to the Hebrews. Read that book. Don't wait until you come in here to hear little snidbits of it, but read it, meditate on it. You're going to start to see the themes and start to see how God wants to speak to you through this letter called the the book of Hebrews. Let me pray for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you do reign supreme. And thank you, God, that you are the beginning and that you are not created, but you are the creator. You are God. You are our heavenly father. You are holy and you deserve our glory. Every one of us in this room should be worshiping you today, not just by being here, but worshiping you in our heart, in our spirit, in our mind, because you are the creator. You gave us the very breath. You gave us the very voice. You gave us the very heartbeat. Even be sitting here, you gave us the very mind that we have to hear these words that go into our ears and to even comprehend them. You gave that to us. You woke us up this morning and brought us here to worship you. You wake up every single person, every person that woke up this morning across the entire globe should worship you today because you are worthy of our worship. Thank you, Jesus, that you have bridged the gap between a lost man and a holy God. There may be those, Lord, that today want to know you. They say, I want to know this God. They must go through Jesus. Jesus, you are supreme. You are above all. You are the Alpha. We thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter that is mysterious, Lord, but we are going to trust you that you're our guide. Even this morning, Lord, as we worship you through communion, that we would not defile it, Lord, by by even going up as a non-believer and saying, well, everybody else is doing it, so I'm going to do it, Lord, that we would first be in communion with you, that those of us that know you would sit and contemplate our lives, contemplate our day, contemplate our week, take this examination that Paul talks about, that you would examine our hearts before we would even come to communion, examine our hearts, and we would invite you to. Lord, we would give you the, the, the reason to do it. We would give you the opportunity to do it. We would say that, Lord, it's your privilege to do this to us, and it is our privilege to receive it from you because we're yours. You own us, Lord. So would you examine us this morning? Would we not defile the Lord's table? Lord, would we take it seriously in reverence of you? Thank you, Jesus. Would we remember you, Jesus, as we as we take communion. We remember the cross. Remember what you did for us, Lord, that you died for us in the place where we deserve to be. And we would remember that this morning. We'd remember what you've done. We love you, and it's in your precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.